right. Um, all right. Welcome, everyone, to the June um, meeting of the uh, Ottawa Centre of the uh, RASC. Uh, th th thanks, uh, thanks for coming. Um, we've got a fine program for you tonight. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please, Chris. Okay, after a brief introduction myself, Gary Boyle will do his uh, usual segment. That's on the uh, Ottawa skies, what to expect in the uh, month of June and uh, uh, in the night sky. We have a special guest uh, speaker uh, today, uh, Dan Falk. You may remember Dan Falk from a couple of years ago. He came and he talked about his uh, previous book, uh, In Search of Time. He's going to be talking about um, references in, uh, in uh, Shakespeare's work to uh, the cosmos. So um, I've seen his presentation. It's, uh, it's, uh, you're, you're in for a treat. Um, we've got a, a bunch of announcements. So we've pulled the announcements that are normally at the end of the meeting. We brought them up to uh, just before the break, OK? Um, be because we want to make sure that we're not rushing those this time. Uh, right after the break, we're going to do the observations. It's again, a bit out of sequence here. I kind of like to move things around because I, I, I get a bit bored and a bit impatient. Uh, it doesn't matter. I can't see any of you any with those lights. <laughs> OK. Um, is that better? OK. Um, all right. Um, so after the, uh, after the observation, the members' observations, uh, Tim Cole is going to be sharing some work, uh, some, uh, a fine presentation on the astrolabe, which is a predecessor to, uh, to the sextant and, and other things, as he'll explain. And then finally, door prizes. We've got a bunch of, for those who haven't been here before, we've got a bunch of door prizes. Uh, pick up tickets at the front. Uh, uh, Sylvie will be helping me. Thank you, Sylvie, uh, giving out the tickets. So we'll, 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 we'll do that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we've got a bunch of new members again. Um, really encouraging to see. Uh, so far this year, we've got 32 new members. Is Mark, Mary, uh, Edgar, um, uh, Michelle, uh, Constant, Constantin uh, here tonight? If you are, say hi. hi. <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome. Okay, we'd love to talk to you, find out what, uh, what uh, drew you to the, uh, the RASC. Um, I'll talk a little bit later on about, um, about um, uh, membership benefits and the things we do uh, throughout the year. Next slide, please. Um, members in the news. We always like to talk about um, some, um, some uh, segments on our, our members. So you may have seen, I think it was uh, actually a week ago now, um, in, the, uh, in the Ottawa Citizen, uh, there was a, a piece uh, on um, the uh, trial of the uh, LEDs that uh, are on, uh, are on uh, Carling Drive. Uh, there's some concern that uh, was raised uh, quite well, actually, in this, in this article. Um, uh, Rob Dick was, was, was quoted, the concern being that the LEDs are too bright, the concern being that the, uh, the LED lighting, uh, street lighting, is, uh, has uh, blue uh, light in it, which, uh, r which uh, reflects and bounces around a lot. Uh, very interesting, if you go on the web, just Google it and read, read this segment, um, you can see that some of the people who are living along the uh, Carling um, uh, are basically saying it's too, it's too bright. They, they're having difficulty sleeping at night. Um, they, they can't close their blinds you know, enough to uh, keep the lights out. And, and of course, as Rob points out in, the, in this uh, article here, um, you can't see the stars at all. So we, um, now Rob talks about some alternatives here. And so it's a, well worth uh, Googling that article if you didn't see it and, and going through it. Uh, nice job, Rob, by the way. Carling is three times brighter now than it was last year. Three times brighter while on Carling. So sometimes we do things that don't really help ourselves. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Next one. Okay, so uh, something that we hope we never have to report on from any of our members is uh, these kind of segments that are appearing more and more in the news, and uh, I'm sure you're seeing it on, uh, on uh, not just in print media, but uh, and it's coming up more and more about, uh, about um, uh, aircraft, helicopters. Um, I, I think I heard there was an orange helicopter as well that was, uh, uh, well, this is the one right here, that um, uh, had a uh, green laser light uh, shine on it. Uh, not good. Uh, to be honest, I, I used to do uh, outreach with laser pointers, and I'm feeling more and more uncomfortable doing that because of these kind of things. Next. Um, something I wanted to share with you. Uh, Gary Boyle does a heck of a lot of uh, outreach on the, uh, on the radio. A ton of people interview him. I mean, I've talked before in previous months about uh, his uh, n national segment on the, uh, on the RESC where he, um, he talks about the night sky segment that he's doing, that you'll hear in a, in a moment. Um, Gary does that also nationally uh, in the uh, RASC.ca website. But um, recently with the uh, Camelopardalids, um, 
he, uh, there was lots of interest in that, that it potentially it could have been a big, huge meteor shower, storm, whatever. Well, as you know, it, uh, it wasn't quite that at all. Um, but uh, Gary Bo was uh, yeah, interviewed by uh, quite a few people. Well done, Gary. That's really nice uh, that uh, you're, you really um, re have a tremendous outreach role there. I think that's it for me. I want to do a very little talk night and get right to the speakers. Gary, up to you. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Mike, and welcome everyone to June Ottawa Skies. Hello, everybody on the internet. Uh, just a couple of things, quick things. I know we have a, a very, uh, very packed night. There is a supernova, um, supernova 2014 BC. It's an it's an M106 um, in Canis Venetici. That's the good news. The bad news is you really can't see it. It's it's right next to the nucleus. Now it was around 15th magnitude when it was spotted in March. It's kind of uh, blossed about 13 and a half. So um, all the astrophotographers out there that we have, you now have homework. So I'd like you to image if you can, and it really close to the nucleus. So uh, it's in the news, but it's not like, like you know, outshining the entire galaxy. It's just really mixed up in the hub over here. Okay, next slide. Well, M106 is right here in, in like I said, Kenneth Venetici, and really pretty well using the Big Dipper to find the, uh, the galaxy. It's uh, about 23 million light years away. It's about ninth magnitude, 8.5 to ninth magnitude, by um, the galaxy itself. But um, overall, you might not see uh, see the supernova unless it gets bright again. But I really doubt it. Okay, next slide. Uh, we do have so how many people have tried for the camel partlets? Excellent. How many saw ten? How many saw nine? Eight. Seven? Yeah, I only saw three, too. Um, Paul, Clon uh, Paul uh, Cloninger and uh, Eric LeMay travel to uh, North Bay and Sudbury for nothing. <laughs> Thanks, Fred, to the economy and the Gaster guys. Really appreciate it. So we do have another meteor shower. This is a, a, um, an annual meteor shower, the South Bootids, as opposed to the Camel Partlids. Um, which was a surprise. They, the comet got too close to Jupiter, and you know the whole story from last month. So we didn't have any history. Uh, even when I got in the air, I said it could be a dud or it could be the... Uh, so I, I protected myself and I said it could be a dud, and it was. But at least I got people outside to look at the nighttime sky, which is a good thing too. So here are the uh, Bootids. Um, I like, I like the, the rate zero, which might, might be again, 200 plus. It's one of these questionable showers. And again, very slow, only 18 kilometers per second, as opposed to the Perseids, which are about 72, 74. So it's, uh, again, it's a slow shower. So uh, June 27th is a weeknight too. I think it's a Tuesday night. So uh, go out and try it, but um, don't expect much. Okay, next slide, please. Um, there's a comet in the sky, which is getting almost uh, naked eye. By next month, it'll be naked eye, come a joke. Um, and it's just over here, pretty well off, off the, uh, the twins, the Gemini twins. Here we have Jupiter and, uh, and Mercury. So it's, you will catch that night uh, pretty low in the sky, but it's getting brighter. It's about uh, eight and a half now, but they think it might come to six or even fifth. So let's hope it will be. Next slide. And just your, your favorite, Strawberry Moon this month, and pick your local, your favorite phase. And that's going to be it for this month. I think. That's it, folks. See you next month. And on to our guest speaker. Thank you. OK, our next speaker, uh, Dan Falk, is a familiar, uh, familiar face. He was here a couple of years ago when he talked about his book, uh, as I mentioned earlier, In Search of Time. Um, he's a science journalist, author, uh, broadcaster. Uh, his, writing, uh, cr uh, he's, his writing and credits include um, uh, submissions, articles in the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, the Walrus, um, and Sky News, and, and so forth. He's uh, be, been on uh, the CBC radio programs uh, Quirks and Quarks, one of my favorite programs, and, uh, and Ideas. Um, he's a, won gold and silver medals for radio programming from the New York, fest, uh, the New York uh, festivals, um, and the Science Writing Award in Physics and Astronomy from the American Institute of Physics, which he won twice. Uh, his first book, Universe on a T-Shirt, The Quest for Everything, The Quest for a Theory of Everything, was um, well received. His most recent book, In Search of Time, The Journeys Along a Curious Dimension, was published in 2008. And um, he, he's, uh, he recently uh, completed a prestigious night journalism uh, fellowship at uh, MIT. Um, pleased to uh, welcome uh, Dan Falk. Let's go.
Oh, thanks for that introduction, and thanks to all of you for, for coming out. Can you hear me at the back okay? All right. I can't, actually, I can't see you at the back, so I don't know if you're putting up your hands or not, but, but I'm going to assume that you can hear me, that you can hear me at the back. Okay. Um, and bear with me for just a second, because um, I've sort of got multiple computers going. I just want to be able to see my next slide on my computer, as well as the current slide on the RESC computer. It's, it's all going to work out just fine, but just bear with me for about 10 seconds while I... Uh, yeah, there we go. All right, so um, Shakespeare and science. This is a little different. If you've perhaps some of you were at my previous talk, or maybe if you're really lucky, you were at both of my previous talks here. Um, but this time it's a little bit of a, a departure because this time there's a, an element of uh, the arts and literature, and um, and it's, it's a bit of a departure from pure uh, sort of physics and astronomy. So what is there to connect Shakespeare and uh, science? Oops, where's the clicker? This is it right here, right? Okay. I don't, it doesn't matter where I am it? Doesn't matter where I am it? Okay. Um, all right, so Shakespeare, you know, wasn't a scientist, and there's, there's no, perhaps no immediate um, uh, connecting thread between these two uh, realms in the, in the title of my, my book. But um, it, when we think about the time that uh, Shakespeare lived, one second here, um, you know, it was it was a very different world. Um, there were a lot of things that seem to us today to be very non-scientific, uh, witchcraft, uh, astrology, magic of various kinds. Um, so, you know, we think of uh, modern science. I mean, modern science was not yet a thing. It simply didn't exist in, in Shakespeare's time. Um, but having said that, when we look at um, sort of the, the period, this period of history with the advantage of hindsight, um, there were a lot of discoveries that, um, you know, looking, looking back, do seem like uh, very uh, important sort of um, uh, landmark events in, in sort of the birth of modern science. And I won't uh, talk through all the, the different ones on the chart, only to say that it, it's a period that kind of begins with uh, Copernicus's book, uh, the De Revolutionibus. This is his book of the, the heliocentric theory, uh, putting, putting the sun at the center of the, the solar system. And then at the, at the, towards the end of this period, we have Galileo uh, aiming his telescope at the night sky and publishing uh, a little book uh, uh, reporting his, his findings and, and finally giving kind of like uh, solid uh, support to, to the Copernican theory, which had really seemed very hypothetical and maybe a bit pie in the sky up until that point. And in between, we've got some other uh, various um, advances. But here's Shakespeare's lifetime, and, you know, he's there. Now, whether he was interested in any of this, of course, is what we're going to talk about and is open for, for debate, but he was there. He at least had a sort of a, a ringside seat for these discoveries because he lives while these things are going on. In fact, uh, Copernicus's book is published uh, a solid uh, two decades before uh, Shakespeare is born, and, and he, he sort of reaches uh, retirement just around the time of Galileo's book, and, and, and I'll have uh, more, more to say about that. Um, so again, there were some uh, traditional ways of seeing things like the, the geocentric picture. This goes back to the ancient Greeks and probably, you know, probably beyond. It was probably the first way that we imagined the cosmos when we got around uh, to being able to conceive of the cosmos. I mean, the Earth, there it is under our feet. Surely it's got to be at the center of everything. And um, if we take a close-up view of the, uh, the Greek view, we find the, you know, the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, uh, at the center. And then surrounding that, we have the, the crystalline spheres that were imagined to hold up uh, the planets, and then the, the outermost sphere uh, holding up uh, the, the so-called uh, fixed stars. Um, but there was, again, a, a, a newer, a more, a more modern uh, picture, and that's um, Copernicus's view, and um, on the right-hand side, you see the, the sort of the simplified diagram. This is a diagram from Copernicus's book, putting, putting the sun at the center. Now, actually, his, his theory was very mathematical and was probably mostly read by mathematicians and a handful of, of astronomers. Um, so conceptually, we think of, of it as this, this great shake-up of events. But again, it was kind of a, a technical work at the time. And, um, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is, well, how far-reaching was its impact? I mean, did ordinary people care? Uh, was it just uh, you know specialists? Now, there was, um, in, in terms of uh, artists and, and writers, some people were kind of affected more than others. Uh, John Milton, now Milton lives a half century after Shakespeare. Uh, he has a very strong reaction to it. He goes on at length as uh, kind of a debate in Paradise Lost as to which uh, which of the two ways of envisioning the cosmos is is more appropriate? And as a matter of fact, he doesn't he doesn't really su seem to support Copernicus, but he certainly knows a lot about Copernicus because he definitely talks about it. Um, the poet John Donne is closer to being a, 
a contemporary of uh, Shakespeare. And I'm just going to read from one of his poems um, called uh, An Anatomy of the World, 1611. Now, this is um, sort of in response to Galileo, right? So this is the, this is the tail end of the, the time chart that we were just looking at. So he's had a chance to, to kind of respond to Galileo's findings, which again seem to support the Copernican theory, and he's a bit taken aback by the whole affair. He says, so did the world from the first hour decay that evening was beginning of the day, and new philosophy calls all in doubt, the element of fire is quite put out, the sun is lost and the earth, and no man's wit can well direct him where to look for it. So he's, um, it's a very strong reaction, kind of a negative reaction uh, to, to these new uh, findings, which, which he labels the, the new philosophy. So it's a, a term uh, that we hear with regard to not just Copernicanism, but other changes that were happening at that time. Uh, you know, 16, uh, sorry, 1543 was a good year because it wasn't just Copernicus's book, it was also Vesalius's book on human anatomy. So it was kind of a, this landmark year, uh, again, with the advantage of, of hindsight. So when we look through Shakespeare's writings, we don't, um, immediately see this kind of uh, direct engagement with the new philosophy. He just doesn't, he's not that kind of a writer. He doesn't tackle it head on. Um, but having said that, when we look at his, his works and comb through them, uh, we see many references to the stars, the heavens, heavenly spheres. It's a, a phrase that crops up quite a bit. Um, the sun, uh, the moon, which always seem to be doing something, rising or setting. Eclipses come up in several places, famously near the beginning of King Lear, but a couple of other uh, places too. Um, meteors and comets, um, although not necessarily meaning the exact uh, same uh, uh, meaning that we ascribe to them today, but they are definitely mentioned. Now, the next thing is a video clip, and is the, oh, it'll play automatically, so I think we're all set. All right, so I'll just, no, it'll be fine. Um, uh, so... All you need to know for this uh, first uh, video clip is it's going to be from uh, Julius Caesar. And um, the subject is, well, uh, the, uh, some of the citizens of Rome are uh, petitioning Caesar. Uh, Caesar had uh, banished uh, the brother of one of these guys. And he's upset. And, and they're, they're all actually a bit upset. So they're trying to uh, get him unbanished. So let's see if we can take a look at the first video clip. It should play automatically. Oops, I have to push this button. Is there no voice more worthy than my own to sound more sweetly in great Caesar's ear for the repealing of my banished brother? I kiss thy hand, but not in flattery, Caesar, desiring thee that Publius Simba may have an immediate freedom of repeal. What, Brutus? Pardon, Caesar, Caesar, pardon! As low as to thy foot of Cassius fall to beg in Francisment for Publius Simba. I could be well moved if I were as you. If I could pray to move, then prayers would move me. But I am constant as the northern star, of whose true fixed and resting quality there is no fellow in the firmament. The skies are painted with unnumbered sparks, they are all fire, and every one doth shine, but there's but one in all doth hold his place. Okay, so there's kind of, you know, there's a little bit of an astronomy lesson in there. Um, it's, it's interesting in, in a number of ways. So one, one thing is, and, and perhaps a bit disappointingly, but it, it doesn't... Um, commit you to either the earth-centered or the sun-centered uh, view. Well, what, what uh, Shakespeare is taking advantage uh, of, the, that, of course, you guys are amateur astronomers, so you know that you know, the earth spins around. I don't know if you can see it, but I'm, it, I, hopefully you can see it. But if you can't, I'm just spinning a styrofoam earth on, it, on its axis. Um, so you know, the earth spins like this. And this orientation, it's like a gyroscope. The, the Earth's axis just points in whatever direction it points. And as it moves, well, we know now that it's moving around the sun, but the, the direction that the axis is pointing doesn't change. Or if you were a geocentrist, you could just say it's here and, and the universe is moving around it. But at any rate, it, it points to a direction where there just happens to be a, a medium bright star, and that's Polaris, the, the North Star. Uh, for those of you who, who know about precession of the equinoxes, just try not to worry about it. It's, it doesn't affect our, our current discussion uh, very, very much. Um, but um, so, whoops, let me find the clicker here. So um, this is the fact that that obviously Shakespeare is taking advantage of. And so if you you know if you were to aim a, a camera at the North Stars, as many of you have done, and just sort of keep the, the shutter open, you get you get something like this. And just taking advantage of this fact that the or the star that happens to be near the center of the uh, in line with the Earth's, Earth's axis isn't going to move, and all the other stars are going to be moving around it, and that's the metaphor uh, that 
Shakespeare has put into Caesar's uh, mouth. Um, so that that sort of works, and again, it doesn't it doesn't um, involve a, a commitment to. Um, to the geocentric or heliocentric view. I should add also, though, but it, this clearly is something that the audience would have got, right? I mean, Shakespeare wouldn't have put it there if the audience was going to be baffled by it. So I think the, he expected some measure of, you know, relatively straightforward engagement of, of the audience uh, in the theater. And, and remember, you know, in Shakespeare's time, there was no light pollution or very little. So now, of course, there were clouds because it's England, right? But when there was a clear day, I think what you saw in the sky was actually pretty important. I bet people talked about it. You know, if there was an eclipse, if there was a comet, I think it was a big deal. Um, I mean, yeah, today there would still, you know, we'd forward things on the internet. But I think back then, you know, no internet, no social media, uh, no video games. I think people were probably quite engaged with, with the sky. All right, I'm going to go to an example perhaps a little bit more, more concrete, something we can really sink our teeth into from Hamlet and the famous opening scene, um, which you'll remember, or just uh, briefly for those who haven't seen the play in a while, of course, there's, there's a ghostly figure that has been uh, appearing on the, the ramparts at, at Elsinore. And uh, he, by golly, he looks a lot like the, the dead king. Um, turns out, we find out later that the, the king was murdered and it's all, it gets kind of involved. Um, but when does the king appear? So this comes up in, in the conversation. Um, Bernardo is, uh, is chatting with uh, Horatio, who has just arrived on, on the, the scene. And he says, last night of all, when yon same star that's westward from the pole had made his course to Ulum, that part of heaven where now it burns, Marcellus and myself, the bell be then beating one. And he doesn't get to finish the sentence, because just then the ghost appears, and, and they have to deal with that. Um, but this is a very interesting uh, scene, and scholars have been trying to figure out, what is this yawned same star that's westward from the pole? So um, what, what do we know about this? Uh, we, we're given, so what do, you know, what do you have to know to find out what's up in the sky at a particular time? You have to know basically two things. And you probably all of you have a planisphere at, at home or, or yeah, you should have a planisphere at home, right? So um, they cost about 10 bucks or so. So, you know, it's, you line up the time of night with the time of year. Those are the only two variables. And once you, you've lined up those two things with each other, this circle shows you everything that's up in the sky, right? And today you can also do it with, with astronomical software. Um, well, uh, what time was it? That's actually given, right? We know it's 1 a.m. because the text says that. Um, the time of year is a bit trickier, and for, because I, I don't have a lot of time uh, haha, to tell you about it, I, I'm just going to tell you that it was probably November, but we can chat later about why we know it's November, but we think, we think it was November. Um, so there were some guesses uh, that different scholars have made. And you know, depending on, on which edition of the plays you're reading, if it's the really thin one, the whole thing just goes unmentioned. If it's a really thick one, there will be some discussion of what star it is. And if you get the, like, the middle one, there will be a little footnote next to uh, uh, star westward from the pole, and it'll say, you know, there'll be an asterisk next to pole, and it'll say in the footnote, pole star, because you, you couldn't have figured out on your own that pole meant pole star, right? So, you know, that's very helpful. So get, go for the thickest one you can get with the most, with the most uh, footnotes. So you'll find editions where they say, well, probably it was a planet, or maybe it was the star uh, Capella. Uh, so for various reasons, um, there, there's some issues there. So here's a diagram of the sky, and now let's see if I got the old, yeah, okay, here's our pointer. All right, so you've got 1 a.m. Uh, in uh, November, and it actually doesn't really matter whether you're doing England or Denmark, they're pretty close to, in terms of latitude, so that's, that's not a big deal. So, so what's going on? All right, I better stay here near the microphone. So there's Polaris. So the pole. All right, and that's the north point on the horizon. No, no problem so far. So westward from the pole. Well, here's west. So what's westward from the pole? Presumably it means somewhere around here. But you might ask, well, why not all the way over here? Well, if it was all the way over here, you wouldn't say westward from the pole. You would just say west. And you, know, you always sort of compare things to what's nearby. If someone asks you, um, where's the Canada Museum of Science and Technology, you're not going to say, well, it's east of Calgary. I mean, it's true that it's east of Calgary, but it's, it's just not the way you would choose to describe it. Um, so we're left somewhere in, in this ballpark. Um, now, the, so a couple of guesses, right? Uh, Capella. Here's the star Capella. Well, is that westward from the pole? I don't think so. I mean, I think that's, that's almost overhead. So, so this is the horizon. The overhead point would be the geometric center, I don't know, somewhere in Auriga, right? So Capella is nearly overhead. And even if we're off, like you know, we said 1 AM November, even if we're off by two weeks in the time of year or half an hour in the time of day, I mean, that would move Capella a little bit. But it's not going to put Capella down here, not really. Now, the other guess was a planet. Well, a planet has to be on the ecliptic, right? Here's the ecliptic. It's the dotted line. 
And that doesn't really work, because we're trying to get over here. I mean, you could be over here, but that's just, it, it doesn't seem to work out. So those guesses don't work very well. By the way, this isn't my own, you know, I'm, I'm, I have the luxury of being a journalist, so I find articles written by other people that have investigated this. In this case, it's, uh, it's Donald Olson at uh, Texas. Uh, so, we're, so what is this object? Well, right, we want, oops, sorry, uh, we lost our, our map. We want something around Cassiopeia. Uh, and by the way, why can't it be Cassiopeia? Oops. Oh, you did that. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, why can't it be Cassiopeia? Well, I mean, it could, except that Cassiopeia doesn't have one single bright star. It has five stars that are all approximately the same brightness. So it would just be a weird thing to say, yawned same star that's westward from the pole, and point to a grouping of five stars. It's just a bit peculiar. Um, you could say Cassiopeia, or you could say the W or something. But it was, okay, uh, you, you can go to, to where we were. Okay, thanks. Um, so there isn't a, a bright candidate star in Cassiopeia, but there used to be one. And I know some of the history of science buffs are, I know are, are one step ahead of me. But there was a bright star in Cassiopeia. And that was what we now call a supernova. It was the new star of 1572. Uh, it's actually indicated here in T Tycho's drawing. It's up here. It's labeled Nova Stella in the little index. And th there it is. These are the five stars. That's the W. There's a couple of extra ones, but that's the W of Cassiopeia. This is the supernova. They didn't know it was a supernova at the time. Tycho Brahe in Denmark observed it. Thomas Diggs in England observed it. Basically, anyone who was looking up at the sky and was interested, you know, took notes and was, was quite excited about this, uh, this thing. This is Donald, this is the reference for this. Donald Olson wrote about it in Ty Sky and Telescope a little while back. Um, I'm going to say a bit more about Tycho Brahe later because he turns out to be an important uh, figure in, um, in this story. Now, if you're doing the math on the date for this, you might think, well, you know, Shakespeare was only a little kid, right? He was eight years old when the supernova appeared. Was really, I mean, was he really going to give a darn? He was only eight years old. Well, I mean, he was already in grammar school. That's one thing. But um, it wasn't just like it appeared and then it was gone a few days later. This thing was very bright and stuck around for about a year, gradually getting dimmer. So people were talking about it, I think probably for a long time. And then Holland said, when he writes his history book a decade or two later, also is talking about how big a deal this thing was. And Shakespeare is an adult by the time this book goes into its second edition. And we know Shakespeare read Holland's head because he's always cribbing from it. Um, so you know Shakespeare could have seen it as a kid and then could have been reminded about it as an adult reading Holland's head's uh, chronicles. Um, I'm going to talk just a bit about some of these other figures that are, uh, are relevant here. I've already. Um, mentioned Copernicus. This is 20 years beforehand. Copernicus publishes his, theory, his heliocentric theory and then dies, which is terrific because he doesn't have to deal with any of the, uh, the fallout from it. Um, Galileo comes at the end of our time period making telescopic observations of the night sky. Um, Tycho Brahe, as I mentioned, is, is the supernova guy, and we'll say a little bit more about him later. Another key figure is the most important English scientist of the time, Thomas Diggs. And yeah, I know. He didn't have time to pose for a selfie like the, uh, like the others did. So we don't know what he uh, looked like. Um, so these are some of the figures that are important in, in sort of the, the astronomy and uh, structure of the cosmos scene. Uh, I, sticking with, with Tycho Brahe, the, the supernova guy, the, his writings about the supernova established his reputation. The king was very impressed, the king of Denmark, and said, look, I'm going to give you an island. This is a pretty good deal if you can get it. The king gave him his own island uh, called Vien uh, in the channel that separates um, Denmark and Sweden and says, and here's a bunch of money, build an observatory like you said you wanted to do and bring glory to the nation. That, that's still how science works today, right? Lots of money if you want to do some research, right? OK. Um, so he does go ahead and builds this grand observatory. And um, it's, it's an interesting um, setting this, in this old map, contemporary to, to the time. You see uh, just uh, right of center there, you see Tycho Brahe's island. Um, and then beside it, we, we can zoom in a little bit. Beside it, there is a, there's a, there's a sea battle going on, so that's cool. But there's, there's a castle just in the lower left. And this is not just any old castle. Um, it's the castle adjacent to the town of, I don't if I'm pronouncing it right, Hel Helsinor, in, Helsinor in Danish, something like that, but in English, Elsinor. So it's not just some random castle. This is the castle that Shakespeare chooses as the setting for the play Hamlet. Hamlet is an older play. There had been versions of it going back probably for centuries. There was a French version that was his most direct source. Um, but they, they just said Denmark, right? It was Shakespeare's original contribution to the play to set it at Elsinor, and a castle that just happens to be within line of sight of the uh, eccentric astronomer's uh, castle. Uh, Shakespeare, as far as we know, never left England, but some of his acting 
uh, colleagues did, his, people from his acting company performed at court in Elsinore. So you can sort of imagine that when they came back, they would have had stories to tell. So I like to think that Shakespeare at least had to know that that island with the astronomer uh, existed. And by the way, King James actually visited Tycho Brahe face to face. Um, he wasn't yet king of England at that time, he was just the king of Scotland, but that's kind of cool too. So Tycho Brahe, Tycho Brahe was, I guess, an eccentric nobleman astronomer, but also like kind of famous, and I think people wanted, people wanted to meet him. So we're not quite finished with, with Hamlet yet. Um, we can look at, for example, the cast of characters uh, in Hamlet, and most of them have sort of classical, vaguely Latin-sounding names, except for the two uh, courtiers, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, who really have extraordinarily Danish-sounding names, right? They have sort of hyper-Danish names. So what is the deal with that, and what was, you know, what was Shakespeare's source, or where did he pull them, or did he just invent them out of whole cloth? Well, the thing is, let's go back to, uh, to our friend, the astronomer Tycho Brahe. Um, Tycho was uh, he had compiled all these observations, and he was keen on sending them, because he wanted to show off. So he was sending them to other astronomers and scientifically-minded thinkers around Europe. And he, they were, he actually had his own publishing uh, uh, printing press on the island, because, again, the king gave him so much money that he could do that. Uh, and he got this professional engraving done. It's a copper plate engraving, which he would use as the, the frontispiece for these observations when he was sending them out. By the way, he did send them to a guy in England and said, can you forward them to Thomas Diggs, the the guy without the selfie that I, I showed earlier, and we'll, we'll talk more about him. He even said, by the way, if you'd like, you know, it'd be great if one of your English poets wanted to write a few lines of verse in honor of me. He said he'd be cool with that. Um, he doesn't mention Shakespeare, but yeah, no, I, right, he was, I think he was that kind of guy. Um, all right, so in this um, fanciful um, engraving, you've got, obviously, that's Tycho Brahe in the middle, and then you've got uh, the crests of various uh, family members from his extended, you know, he was a nobleman, so all, all his relatives were uh, important uh, no noble people. And sure enough, there's Rosencrantz and there's Guildenstern. I know a couple of you saw it coming, but uh, yeah, there they are. And, uh, you know, is it, is it a coincidence or is it not a coincidence? And we can, we can talk about that. But, but it's quite plausible, I think, that Shakespeare either saw this engraving or, you know, was talking to people who had recently... Been to, you know, there, there's, I think there's some kind of a connection there more than can just be sort of d dismissed as, as complete coincidence. Um, all right, so I've talked about everything. Well, I've, Gal Gal Galileo I'll get to in a minute. I do want to say a bit more about Thomas Diggs. Uh, Thomas Diggs um, published a updated version of an almanac that had first been printed by his, his father, who was an astronomer. Um, uh, Diggs uh, adds a whole new chapter, uh, sort of pumping up the Copernican system. So this is actually the first popularization of the Copernican system printed in England, you know, in English for, for an English-speaking audience. And he goes further than Copernicus because he includes this diagram, which is actually quite large. It folds out uh, when, you, when you buy the book. Um, it's a diagram that seems to, so it's the standard Copernican view with the, uh, the sun at the middle, and here's the Earth over here. But he has the stars now, not just on a single sphere, but extending outward, as far as we can tell, without any bounds, so possibly even infinite. So do we see anything like that in Shakespeare's works? Maybe, and maybe we don't have to look any further than Hamlet in Act Two, Scene Two. I mean, this is a bit speculative, but you know, it, it's 400 years ago. We're allowed to speculate a little bit. Um, you know, is, is Denmark a really horrible place? Uh, the, actually, the correct answer is no, Denmark's really nice. But, but the, uh, the topic for discussion is how, how horrible is it? Hamlet says, um, oh, sorry, the, the, the question is, um, you know, is, is, it a, is it a prison? Uh, Hamlet says, why then, tis, tis known to you, for there is nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. To me, it is a prison. Uh, Rosencrantz says, why then, your ambition makes it one, tis too narrow for your mind. And Hamlet comes back with, oh God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space were not that I have bad dreams. So you have this unusual line, king of infinite space, and it's not something that Shakespeare uses very often and it doesn't even crop up in other uh, Tudor era uh, drama. It's just not a very common expression. And even when Shakespeare does say infinite, he's usually not talking about spatial extent, but here he is. So it's, it's, it's quite a, an odd thing. And you know, does it, is it a reference to... Um, to the in, you know infinitely extendeth ing uh, universe of Thomas Diggs, his countrymen, possibly. Um, all right, I just I know we're a bit short on time. Uh, there there are more connections between the family of Thomas Diggs and Shakespeare 
they were sort of neighbors. I, 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 I'm going to have to just gloss over that because I don't want to have to move along. But it, it is quite interesting. The, these are not just two random people living in London. Um, uh, the, the son of Thomas Diggs actually becomes a poet and writes a little verse in praise of Shakespeare that gets published in the first folio in 1623. So it, it's quite interesting. There's some connection between Shakespeare and the family of uh, Thomas Diggs. So that gets us on towards, I think Galileo is the next, um, the next thing. So Galileo, again, comes at the, the end of this interval. And remember, he, doesn't, he only gets his hands on a telescope in 1609. He doesn't invent it. It's a Dutch invention. But he quickly improves it. He's the first one, or among the first few, because there actually is an Englishman, Thomas Harriet, doing the same thing. It's quite interesting. Harriet, for whatever reason, chooses not to publish. Um, but Galileo. Uh, points his telescope at the night sky in the fall of 1609, and by the following spring, he's, he's published a little book um, uh, called Sidereus Nuncius, The Starry Messenger, and he's discovered that there are irregular features on the surface of the moon. There's also kind of a, a Death Star thing going on, which we can, there's a whole literature on why is that crater so big and what's going on, but I don't have to skip over that for now. But um, he finds these irregularities on the surface of the moon. He finds uh, these are his original drawings. were actually perhaps more more lifelike and, and vivid. Um, he finds four objects that no one had seen before, seeming to revolve around Jupiter. And now we call them the Galilean moons of of Jupiter. But at first he was wondering, what are these stars and what are they doing? But he eventually clued in. There's four of them, and they must revolve around Jupiter because even as Jupiter moves across the sky, they stay with it. And he also aimed his telescope at the you know, the Milky Way and was able to resolve that these, this wasn't just a cloudy band. There are actually thousands of stars too faint to see with the eye, which you could see through the telescope. So all of this is kind of shocking. And uh, later he would go on to see Venus going through uh, phases. Um, it all sort of lends support to the, uh, to the Copernican system. So again, this comes kind of late in the game. So you could say, well, Shakespeare couldn't possibly have had time to soak that in because I mean, you know, he writes his last play around 1612, 1613. I mean, it's just too late in the game. But people have pointed to, so I don't think that's correct. And a few, a few small number of scholars have pointed to the play Cymbeline and said that the dramatic uh, fifth uh, act, uh, again, you know, I don't know whether to leave the whole thing as a tease. I, I can't talk you through it because it's, it's a little bit involved. And also, I'd have to explain the plot of Cymbeline, which by itself takes about a minute, even if you talk quickly. Um, but uh, there is a dramatic scene near the end of Cymbeline where Jupiter, the god, comes down from the sky. And this is not something that happens a lot, or actually at all, except for this one scene in the Shakespeare canon. And then four ghosts move around our hero as he lies uh, sleeping on the on the stage, just so it's there's something that kind of looks like it might be alluding to um, to Galileo's discoveries, and that's pretty interesting. And I thought oh, when I first heard about this, I thought, well, there must be dozens of articles on this. I mean, this must be the most exciting thing that Shakespeare scholars could possibly write about. Uh, but no, there's actually only about three people who have written articles about this. But I think it's pretty cool. Um, so to finish off, um, I want to just talk about. Um, sort of the worldview in general, never mind sort of heliocentric, geocentric, but how did people in Shakespeare's time envision the world? And this is something that, of course, the characters in King Lear confront. It's a very dark play, right? So, so bad things happen, and, and bad things even happen uh, to good people. And when that happens, of course, you want to know uh, who to blame, because you're not going to blame yourself. I mean, you always do the right thing and make the right choice. So it has to be somebody's fault that all these, all these things are happening. And, and one option that you've got is to blame the heavens, you know, blame, blame the stars, blame, blame the universe. And again, in this period, um, there was imagined to be this very intimate connection between what was happening up there in the celestial realm and what was happening here, families, political affairs. So terrestrial stuff, celestial st stuff, imagined to be intimately linked in, in some way. Um, so let's, is, is the next one the video? Yep. The next one's the video. OK. So um, I'm going to show a clip from King Lear. Um, all you have to know is that um, it's, pretty er it's pretty early in the play. There are two characters. Um, Gloucester, who is one of uh, the nobles. He's sort of uh, an ally of King Lear. It doesn't really matter. And his illegitimate son, Edmund, uh, who will end up sort of being a, a villain. Um, and the subject for discussion is these late eclipses of the sun and moon. So that's what they're talking about. The thing to look out for is that Gloucester and Edmund interpret the eclipses very differently. And it's a slightly longer clip than the Julius Caesar clip because uh, towards the end, Edmund turns evil. And that's kind of fun to watch. It's fun to watch someone who have their Darth Vader moment like that. So let's have a look at that. 
These late eclipses in the sun and moon portend no good to us. Though the wisdom of nature can reason it thus and thus, yet nature finds itself scourged by the secret effects. Love cools, friendship falls off, brothers divide. In cities, mutinies, in countries, discord, in palaces, treason. And the bond cracked twixt son and father. This is the excellent foppery of the world, that when we are sick in fortune, often the surfeits of our own behavior, we make guilty of our disasters the sun, the moon, and stars, as if we were villains on necessity. Fools by heavenly compulsion, knaves, thieves, and treachers by spherical predominance, drunkards, liars, and adulterers by an enforced obedience of planetary influence, and all that we are evil in by a divine thrusting on. An admirable evasion of whore master man to lay his goatish disposition on the charge of a star. My father compounded with my mother under the dragon's tail. And my nativity was under Ursa Major, so that it follows I am rough and lecherous. I should have been that I am had the maidenly star in the firmament twinkled on my bastardizing. Edgar. Patty comes like the catastrophe of the old comedy. My cue is villainous melancholy with a sigh like Tom of Bedlam. Oh. These eclipses do portend these divisions. So there's some good there's some good stuff in there. Um, you know, I was actually just thinking as an aside. I, obviously, I'm not a, a director in the theater business, but what a hard job it is because that scene, um, uh, Edmund sees Edgar and says his name, but then reads a whole paragraph before he engages uh, Edgar in conversation, which so they pulled it off, right? They pulled it off by having him appear like at the back of the room, pause, and then walk slowly uh, towards the camera. But I would have been, it would have taken me a week to figure out how to stage that. But anyway, the BBC and the Royal Shakespeare Company pulled it off quite, quite nicely. Uh, it's playing at Stratford this summer too. Um, okay, so what, where does that leave us? You know, we've got, was Shakespeare, uh, superstitious like Gloucester? Was he a skeptic like Edmund? You can make up your own mind, but I, I, I kind of think that he's got to be on Edmund's side because how could you, you know, it's, when, once you start making fun of, of Gloucester and it's so ridiculous, I mean, I kind of have to imagine that that was sort of how Shakespeare saw things or at least he was willing to, to embrace that view. Um, now, does that mean that Shakespeare was some sort of a hard-nosed, uh, scientifically-minded uh, rationalist? Uh, well, no, that's, that's silly. That's, uh, that's taking things a little bit too, too far. But at the same time, uh, I don't think Shakespeare was um, this, oops, uh, sorry, I've been pushing the wrong, I pushed the wrong button. Uh, so I meant, when I said, was he a skeptical guy, you were supposed to be looking at this. Apologies, I was playing with the wrong computer. Um, uh, but he, at the same time, he wasn't this uh, medieval, uh, you know, caught up in this this world of, of magic and and um, sort of you know astrology and magic. Even though he was obviously aware of it, because he references all of these ideas uh, in his plays. Um, so I don't think you know. I think he's a, uh, this is the world he comes from, and I think he just has in his imagination uh, you know hints of where the world is heading, although of course we cannot call him a scientific figure. But I think he's in the middle, and I think the fact that he is a transitional character is, is part of what sort of fuels his genius and part of what makes it so interesting to, to, to read these works, and of course for, for many other reasons as well. So um, again, I, you know, I couldn't have done, I'm a journalist and, and I've been reading up, but, but none of this would, uh, I, you know, to, to write my book, obviously I relied on the research of many other people, far too many to list, but these are some of the key figures whose, whose papers and, and books were, uh, were crucially important in, in all of this. And um, I will leave it at that, so, so thank you very much.
So we have time for some questions. Sylvia is the um, microphone runner. She's on the side there. Um, maybe what I'll do is here, I'll start off with just a quick question. Uh, sure. And, uh, and so you mentioned the four ghosts of Jupiter. So what was the timing of that with reference to Galileo's discovery? Sure. Should I come to the mic? Or? Yeah, you should. Okay. Um, and if you want, you can put up the, the one of the or is that too close? There's in the bonus slides. I've got uh, some some. Just, just some. move on. We can advance it. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, the timing. This is this is the just before Jupiter descends from the heavens. Um, the the hero is uh, posthumous Le Leonatus. Uh, it's okay if you haven't seen the play. Like most people haven't. Actually, just by show of hands, who has either seen or read Cymbeline? A f a f like three or four hands have gone up. Yeah. Uh, what about um, Hamlet? And what and what about King Lear? Yeah, it's a huge difference. Huge difference. Like ten to one. So that's interesting. Um, uh, yeah, the timing. Um, Cymbeline, we, of course, we don't know exactly when it was first performed, but we believe, uh, you know, according to the, the, the historians, um, l summer or fall of 1610. So the timing works out perfectly. In other words, it would have been a few months after the publication of Galileo's book. And by the way, Galileo's book was a bestseller. Everybody was grabbing it up. Um, the first edition, like, people were buying it in Venice, uh, and it was, you know, they were all gone within a few days, and they had to print more. A and copies were sent to England. We know that. The, the English ambassador sent a copy. Uh, it's in the book, but I've forgotten the details. He th sent a copy, I, I think, to the king, but it might have been to somebody in, in the court, but, you know, saying, like, this is the craziest book I've seen, like, in ages. You've got to look at this. So everybody, I mean, not everybody, but, like, everybody, you know, today when we say, well, everybody's really interested in string theory or something, we mean, like, some people are interested in it. But, but yeah, it, it got a lot, I mean, probably more. That wasn't a good example. I think it was more, more exciting than, than string theory. Uh, maybe, like, string theory and the Higgs boson combined into one or something like that. Anyway, um, so... Uh, yeah, so I think it's quite plausible that Shakespeare heard about it, maybe saw, I think probably saw Galileo's book. Why not? He loved to read. He was reading Holland's Head. He was reading Montaigne. He was reading Ovid. Why not read? He doesn't have to act. You know, he could just flip it. He could just look at the pictures and read the, you know, the information about the pictures of the moon, of the stars in the Milky Way, of, of Ju the Jupiter observation. So, yeah, the timing, the timing kind of works out. Like, it, it actually is, I think, very plausible. And, and so that's why I'm surprised that only, only three people or, or a very small handful of people have actually like, published articles kind of investigating this. Any other questions, comments? All right. Good. I guess I guess I explained everything. All right, great. <laughs> but I'll be around later if, if you know if anyone buys a book, I'm, I'm more than happy to, to sign a copy and that sort of thing. So yeah, cool. Thank you, Thank you again, Dan. Um, I'm sure most of you noticed that, as Dan was saying, that he's, there's a, a bookseller has, um, has, a, has a display uh, in the front and selling books. So uh, we'll, uh, they'll be there during the, uh, during the break for sure. I'm not so sure they'll be uh, after the meeting, but uh, for sure during the break. All right, so wonderful. We, uh, we've got a couple of announce uh, announcements. Uh, Majid? Okay, um, Majid Naji is a um, recently uh, finished his PhD in uh, in electrical engineering, and he has a um, announcement about an upcoming event uh, at um, that, I, that I'm gratefully sharing with us. Let's come Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. And hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Majid. I'm uh, from the SPIE, the International Society uh, in Optics and Photonics uh, student chapter at the University of Ottawa. I'm here to announce our next event because we always have some events regarding optics and the, the photonics and, of course, astronomy. Our next event will be on the June 20 in Ottawa U. It's about the James Webb Space Telescope. So our distinguished uh, guest with me, Dr. Stahl from the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, and he will present uh, an, informative inform uh, inform uh, an informative uh, presentation about the James Webb Space Telescope, and I'm here to announce it and also invite all of you to come as our special guest and wish to see all of you. The place will be in the Ottawa U in the site building, 800 King Edward. Wish to see all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Majid. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. Um, a couple of announcements, then we'll go to a, br a break. Um, 
Every year, we have been support, every year for the last couple of years, we've been uh, working with the Cube Gallery on their annual Nocturne uh, event, their sort of a festival of the night. Um, they've asked us once again to join them um, for their uh, two events um, in, in, uh, in, in July, July 3rd and July 10th. They're planning to have two uh, star parties on uh, Julian Avenue. Um, recall they've turned off the lights. They, they worked with the city to turn off the lights on uh, Julian Avenue. It's a great event right smack in the middle of the city. Um, I know a number of you have participated in past years. Uh, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it because the residents are really accommodating and uh, it's, it's nice to see. Rob Dick, you'll notice his name's up there again, is uh, delivering a presentation. Um, LEDs, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm sure an extension of what he's, we talked about earlier. Next slide, please. Um, I sent out a note to RAC members uh, er earlier about um, Astro Pontiac. You, you may remember St Stefana Pape, who's, uh, who has um, uh, talked about his, uh, his um, uh, now I'm forgetting the name of it, the, um, Pon uh, Pon uh, the Pontiac uh, Astro Park um, that he's interested in setting up in, 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 in Elmer. Uh, and um, he, he's the tireless fellow that keeps driving forward of this. He's got a vision to have a, uh, an outdoor venue, um, a, a planetarium as well, uh, a place where uh, we can set up our t uh, telescopes and be offering public stargazing. And, uh, and uh, he's keen on going forward this. He's been talking about this for a couple of years now. Now he's really moving forward. He's uh, stepping up his, uh, his awareness campaign, his, his, um, his uh, uh, fundraising efforts, and so forth. So he's asked us for our support for solar observing uh, on um, Jan uh, Jan June the 15th, uh, coming up. Um, and he's got a couple of rain dates, June 16th and June 18th. Now, for those of you who are observant, you'll have noticed that they, one of the rain dates changed. It went from June 17th to June 18th. So a number of you have stepped forward already. Thank you. I probably could take one more uh, uh, volunteer. Sounds like it's going to be a pretty good event. And I'd really like to help uh, Stefan because uh, helping him will help us, I think, having this, uh, this um, in, our, in our community, that's for sure. Next slide. Um, I wanted to say a couple of things really quickly before we go to the break. Um, for those of you who are, who are here tonight and not RASC members, we do have a number of benefits in being a, a, a member of the RASC. We have a, a telescope library. Um, as a member, you can, uh, you can sign out a, a number of different telescopes. Uh, we also have, in the, you can notice in the bottom there, that's the uh, Fred Lossing Observatory. It's an observatory that our center members uh, can use. Um, and we have a, uh, just around the corner here, we also have a uh, astronomy library. Um, and each, um, and you, it's filled with astronomy books that you can sign out. Next slide. Um, also, with your membership, you get a number of publications. What you see on this on the um, on the screen here, and uh, during the break, we'll uh, show you another slide that we'll display that'll show all, uh, many other be uh, benefits of membership. Okay, so we've got uh, a couple of uh, uh, members uh, members observations. First up is. Um, Raymond Dubois and uh, Pierre Martin. I guess you probably can guess what they're going to talk about. Holes in the ground. You got explaining to do. Yeah. Want your money back? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we, um, uh, there was a lot of anticipation, as you probably know, about the Camelopardalid meteor shower uh, peak on uh, May 24th. That it was a very unique situation that the Earth was passed through multiple dust trails left behind a century or two ago by the, uh, the comet. Uh, but there was a lot of, um, of uh, question as far as the rates. Uh, there was an expectation that it might be a strong Perseid-like shower, or it could be a dud, or it could be maybe even a meteor storm. And as it turned out, it was, the rates were very low. It turned out the shower was active, uh, but on a very low level. And um, is this better? Yes. Okay. So uh, as I was saying, the uh, Campbell part of lead, uh, we're expected to put on a, a strong showing this year for the first time, but there was a lot of unknowns, so nobody really could tell what would be the outcome. And as it turned out, it was a relatively weak uh, shower, but nonetheless still active. So we can have the, the first slide. So the, um, uh, what uh, Raymond and I decided to do was to travel out uh, west from Ottawa. We um, were having a clearing sky, but late in the evening. But we were confident that by traveling out towards uh, Cobden or Pembroke, we would be okay to, and this is essentially what we got. We got a relatively clear sky all night and uh, just a few cloudy periods, but enough to really get a good sense of the shower and have a, uh, and myself get a good formal observation. So I, um, Signed on around 11 o'clock, 
And uh, that early in the evening, I, my hopes are actually very high because as I was setting up my cameras, even before I signed on for my meter watch, I saw one camelopardalid, like, and it was gorgeous. It was a very slow meter, magnitude zero, changed colors a few times, and there was no question that it lined up perfectly with the uh, radiant. So I was like, wow, this is, there's already one, and it's uh, still hours away before the peak. Uh, so I set up my camera and then got everything going. The moment I, I set up in my lawn chair to uh, formally sign on and start watching uh, a minute after, I saw a really bright one into the northeast. It was a magnitude minus three cam. And uh, it, again, very slow, like barely faster than a fast moving satellite. And it was gorgeous. It, it had also a very unusual look to it where it seemed to um, uh, basically uh, uh, dissipate and fragment into uh, a nebulous appearance towards the end of its path. That made it really interesting. But uh, as it turned out, the night, uh, the, the rates never did pick up. Uh, there was a slight enhancement around 3 o'clock in the morning. I would say uh, the ZHR reached around 10, 12 an hour for a very short time. And by that time, the meters were very dim. So the, uh, anyone with any moderate light pollution would have easily missed out. So I'll let uh, Raymond talk about the, the capture, which is the, uh, this first meter that I managed to see as well. And Raymond had his camera pointed in, in the right direction to capture the, the minus three cam. So Raymond. So, well, this was taken at about uh, five to midnight. So it was really early in the evening. And uh, well, so this is what's the, what's, what was taken. Close to the microphone, please. Oh, this, this one was taken at about 5 to midnight. And after. No? No. Uh -huh. no. There. And I got a persistence after it passed. So before. And after. So for a cam, having a persistence, I was pretty lucky. And it was really, turned out really nice. My next photo, thank you. And my next photo, it was about, is uh, 1.20 in the morning. And you just barely see it on the top left-hand corner of the Milky Way. But if you take a look very closely, I don't like pointers. Right here, you see a bit of green. I think I got a bit of the northern lights way up here in Ottawa at the same time. And the orange is part of the city glow. So I'm, I'm pretty happy. It turned out pretty good. <laughs> yeah. OK, a couple of uh, my uh, results. Oops, uh, wrong. Uh, wrong. OK, here is the uh, shot. That was a wide angle shot that I took with uh, my Canon 6D and a 35 millimeter lens. Only a 50-second exposure. I was uh, tracked. And you can see the uh, light glow from Ottawa reflecting on some of the distant clouds and the rising summertime Milky Way, the uh, Cygnus uh, region. So I was hoping to have this sort of shot with uh, a composite with the meteors uh, through. But as it turns out, that camera, even through the entire night, did not actually capture a single uh, meteor, but a, a large, large number of different satellites. The uh, second camera that I was uh, running on my mount was a, um, a 5D with um, a slightly, um, a well, more normal uh, um, uh, standard lens, 50 millimeter. And the uh, meter that you see here is actually, it's not a cam, but it's uh, sporadic that I captured. Uh, where it was a fast one with a, a green streak. So I looked at this, this picture, and I, and I also managed to capture a little bit of the, um, the, the possibly the distant aurora. You can see there's a bit of a green streaks in the picture, either the northern lights or maybe a mix of that in the natural air glow that we can sometimes see with a, a green hue like that. So there is also the, um, I'm not sure if we, whoops. OK. Uh, you might notice there's. A little green object right here. This, and just for reference, the stars of the Big Dipper are right here. This is the um, the Dipper. The tail would be extending up here. Uh, so right down here, notice there's a slightly green object, and it, it sort of captured my my attention. I was wondering what what that could be. Um, maybe possibly the comet Lanier that I knew was out in the western sky somewhere, but I wasn't too sure. So I looked it up, and it turns out on the uh, 
on the next one, you see it a little bit better still. Uh, this is actually Comet uh, K1 Panstars that's uh, starting to uh, be quite visible. It's actually, I, I would expect that this would be a nice teles telescopic uh, site right now with a, a nice dust, um, a dust tail. Uh, but the, I was surprised that I managed to capture it and I wasn't really looking for it. It just caught my eye as I was processing the picture. And, uh, some, and by, luckily, the, the meteor flashed right by the, uh, the comet. So um, what you see here is that I pulled this off the next day of uh, the shower. It's bas basically, this is the uh, image of the uh, Canadian Meteor Orbit Radar. It's a system that um, uh, detects meteors automatically. And uh, you know, using a 3D uh, software, it'll automatically pinpoint the radiant for each meter that it detects throughout the last 24-hour period. And uh, each of these radiant are plotted into this uh, all-sky chart. So uh, it, uh, it, it's a good way to determine which showers or which uh, area of the sky is actually active in producing uh, meteors. So what's really interesting is the, um, if you look at, um, OK, there we go. Here's the um, camelopartalid shower that was active on the morning of the 24th. And right at the expected ra radiant point, this is Ursa Minor, Ursa Major. So exactly where it was expected to happen. But what's really interesting, and that, it had me kind of puzzled when I saw this, is that normally when you see something like this, it shows, especially with this deep color, it shows that it was a significant activity, that it should have been a shower nearly as strong as a Perseids or, and such. But this is not at all what I saw, what I also saw, or many of you did see. But as it turned out, the uh, explanation is the uh, meteors were, the, the dust particles from that shower was very, very small. It was something we did not expect, that the, um, uh, the meteors were mainly around magnitude 6 to 8, so beyond uh, visual uh, capability. For, we just did not see those meteors, which is too dim. But the radar did capture it and showed a very, uh, a very strong area where the radiant was for that shower. So um, it was a peak, but it was not an impressive visual shower, for the exception of a few nice meters that we did see, which actually made for an interesting night. And even with a, a very low-level shower that, like this, I find that it's always interesting to see something new that we haven't seen before. And the, the level of uh, unexpected uh, event that we, um, it, it's always a bit of a surprise not knowing what might happen. And that's the part I find that makes meteor observing exciting. Is also no. Okay. I'm okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Paul. Just one one slide before we. Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, so here's an interesting one from uh, Malcolm Park, which um, um, some of you may know is the organizer of the uh, Starfest. Uh, he's with the North York Astronomical Association. So. Um, this is interesting here because that main streak isn't, isn't uh, one, of the, one of the meteors. In fact, it's the uh, International Space Station. So it's interesting because I was reading from a number of the uh, on a number of email uh, uh, groups that uh, you know there was a, a fair amount of disappointment. People, as, as, as pointed out earlier, there, there wasn't m many that actually s s saw the uh, camelopartalids, but um, there, a lot of people were saying the ISS was really spectacular. So, so this is a, this is quite a uh, this is quite a, a shot. Three meteors in that one image. So he's got three in that. Uh, yeah, that's right. And the ISS is what the a couple, couple, four or five minutes, maybe. Uh, so uh, he's uh, he did well and uh, nice, nice background star. See uh, um, Big Dipper and so forth. All right, uh, up to you, Paul. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I too went out to see the storm of the century, which wasn't quite the same. Um, Four days prior to the uh, predicted event, I did manage to get out and bag the parent body of that, of that shower that wasn't, and that's uh, Comet Linear uh, 209P. Uh, you can see it there. This was, a, was a, an interesting object to try to catch. This, uh, even though this comet was fairly close to us, 
it was also very, very small and very, very faint. This is, in fact, the faintest comet I've ever tried to image. So uh, I didn't even see that. I could only make it out in my images there. So I just pointed it at the correct coordinates there and took a series of, of shots there. This is a stack of 15 70 second exposures. And you can see the little guy there with his, uh, with his dust tail producing very fine particles there. So uh, it was an interesting thing, though, because uh, I've, never, I've never imaged a, a meteor shower. And um, I still didn't with this one. But uh, I've never imaged a meteor <laughs> shower and the parent body uh, on the same pass there. So it was, uh, it was an interesting challenge there. But th there it is. There's the culprit there that caused a few of us to have some sleepless nights. So four days later, uh, Oscar and I was, uh, you stand corrected there, Gary, it was Oscar and I that, uh, that traveled up to uh, Sudbury. We, were, uh, we, had, we had determined to go on a mission to, uh, to find out clear skies because the uh, forecast for our area here had turned uh, noticeably poor. And uh, so we each took the day off there. It was a good reason to take the day off there and decided to drive up to northern Ontario somewhere. So it was a bit of an adventure for us because we were storm chasing, as it were. Not, not tornadoes or anything, but uh, it, was, uh, it was kind of interesting because the cloud systems were being very dynamic and we wanted to park ourselves in an area of clear sky. And uh, we wound up about uh, 20 kilometers uh, north of uh, uh, Sudbury. And uh, it was interesting. Uh, we, we had beautiful clear skies all night long, no clouds, no, no anything like that. So we did our part. The meteor shower didn't quite do its part, but we did manage to see in total seven uh, of the CAM meteors. Uh, I had three cameras going, took 600 images, and bagged two meteors. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I bagged more meteors than that, but the better ones were, as you'll see in a moment, were sporadics. But uh, uh, the interesting thing on the, on the uh, two cams that I did bag that were, that were worthy, uh, uh, as Pierre mentioned, uh, they were colorful. Uh, they were slow, and they, and they exhibited color as they, as they uh, burned up and disintegrated. So that was one of the images that I took. Uh, and you can see there, oh, where's the pointer there? There we go, top button, I presume. You can see there is a persistence there as well. Uh, I'm not sure if that was a characteristic because of these meteors being slow as they were, but uh, uh, I caught a number of, well, I, I caught a couple of them that showed uh, the persistent uh, trail or, or dust afterwards there. So I'll just roll it back one again. There you can see the meteor. Uh, these, these images were 30 seconds uh, uh, in duration with about a five second gap in between there. So went from that to that, and you can see the, uh, the, uh, the debris that was left by that. So uh, the other one I took, there was another one there. Was, uh, the, the ones that I did manage to get, they were they were pretty good. They were they were uh, they were they were pretty enough. Uh, but the whole interest, the, the whole experience was kind of interesting because Oscar and I were up at Sudbury. Uh, Tony Peterson and uh, Eric LeMay were about 80 kilometers to our east, up near North Bay, and then uh, Gary and Sylvie were down at your place, right? And uh, it was kind of interesting. We were all 30 second walk from the door. 30 second walk from the door, yeah, yeah. But uh, we, we were all trading, oops, we were all trading emails as to what we were seeing or not, as the case may be. So it was kind of interesting that we were in these widely dispersed locations and, uh, and able to, to know what, what was happening in, in, in the other locations there. So we kept trading emails all night. And because the uh, shower was a little bit slow, around 2 in the morning, I texted Gary and Sylvia and told her that uh, Oscar and I had just seen 50 fireballs in the last two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what their response to my text was. I'll leave that for another. I'm sure you heard his laugh all the way from <laughs> Well, you got to do something when you're out in the middle of the field and there's no meteors, right? <laughs> so, yes? This image looks like it's a zoom in from a, it is. a wide angle image because the trail looks curved due to lens distortion. That's exactly right, Glenn. You hit it right on the head. How to go, Glenn. Actually, I was shooting, uh, I was shooting uh, as I mentioned, a few different cameras there. Uh, one of them, this one, in fact, and the, and the previous one, were, were with a DSLR with an 8 millimeter, the 8 millimeter fisheye that I've talked to you about in the last number of sessions there. That was a, that was a great uh, uh, lens for capturing most of the sky and the meteors that weren't there. Uh, but uh, it, it at least gave me a, 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 an indication that it wasn't just me not looking in the right places. But uh, you're right, there was, it was a crop in there. Um, following, following that, uh, just it, as the evening went on there, I did manage to catch a really bright meteor there. Uh, this was a sporadic though. This was uh, this is uh, not related to the shower at all, but it was uh, you can see from the from there's 
the Big Dipper there. So you can see that it's, uh, it was quite extensive. It was very bright, um, probably about minus two or minus three. It was, uh, yeah, and it was very fast as well. And you can see uh, one of my other cameras there uh, got into the frame as, as we were shooting there. So it was rather interesting there. That was the best catch of the night, though. So this one, oh, this one is actually, <laughs> I wasn't, ordinarily I wouldn't have included this shot and uh, if our projector wasn't misaligned, you would see, you would see that over in the corner here, maybe some of you can actually see it projected on the wall there, I actually caught uh, the tail of a, of a fairly bright little meteor, it's just there. And ordinarily, I wouldn't have bothered showing this because, yeah, it's not really spectacular or anything. Oops. Uh, I did that. Now you can see it. Oh, can you? Oh, thank you. So you can see the little guy here, and it was fairly bright. I think it was a sporadic. The, the course seemed to be, it didn't seem to trace back to the radiant. It was, it was somewhat close there, but I think it was a sporadic. Actually, it does look like it does it back to the radiant. You think? Yeah? Yeah? Flyers well, um, just under the 14. No, that's the, that's the bowl of the Little Dipper there. Polaris extends down to... Yeah, okay, well, all right. So it, it possibly was a cam there. But the interesting thing about it, if we can go back to the, uh, the, the regular view, uh, what I did is I, 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 I zoomed in on this, and because this was a sequence, this was with an 18 millimeter lens, there was a sequence, these were being banged off. Um, a one minute duration uh, with about a five second gap in between. When I examined this meteor and stretched the, uh, the, the curves and stuff, uh, I noticed something rather interesting. And again, ah, oh geez, it's just, just at the top there. You can see just the, thank you. You can just see the tail there. So I thought, well, this is fairly bright. It's, it's also colorful like a cam, so you're, you're right, it probably was a cam. But that wasn't the interesting part. What I noticed was that in the subsequent frames, uh, there was a persistent trail that lasted for over 20 minutes. And so what I've done, if we can go back there, Chris, to the full screen view, what I've done is I've uh, I, I stitched together a bunch of those frames, and, and it's, it looks really grainy because I had to stretch it. The, the train is, is very, very subtle. And I've masked out most of the, most of the sky images just to draw your attention to that area that, that isn't masked out there. Because what, what you're going to see as, as we roll the, uh, the short movie is that the, uh, after the meteor flares out, uh, uh, you, you'll, see the, you'll see a bit of a trail there, and it's going to gradually move this way and disperse and get dimmer as we go. So if we can roll that, Chris, there. Oh. Oh. Wow. <laughs> the satellite zipped through there as well, of course. So yeah, you can just see that. And as I said, this, this persisted for 20 minutes. I, I, have, I looked at the shots after the end of this sequence. I only went up to as far as I did there. There's some evidence that it persisted even, even a bit longer, but it's right into the noise floor of the image. So it's really kind of hard to tell. So I just showed you the sort of the best of. But yeah, about 20, 24 minutes in, in total uh, of, of its persistence there. So that was, uh, that was rather nice. One minute, Paul. Okay, I'm, I'm done. Oh, thank you. And, and as we were packing up, you can see our sky was, was wonderful up there. As we were packing up, I just let the camera roll in case we got some, some, some uh, nice dawn meteors. Didn't get any at all, but I did get this nice, very nice iridium flare uh, just as the dawn light was breaking there. So that was a, kind of a nice way to cap the evening. So it was a fun ex experience overall. Thank you. Okay, I only have one shot. I didn't do any meteor uh, imaging at all. In fact, you said about 12.20, it was raining at my place at 12.20. I just couldn't believe how fast it cleared out. So I thought the night was forlorn, but got to see three, yes. So just one image taken here way back in uh, March 23rd. It was about uh, two o'clock in the morning, just happened to be up. It was a Saturday morning, just didn't want to get to bed yet. And just looked outside, just saw the, uh, the moon was just about to emerge from the clouds. But here we have the, the lights of Iroquois, uh, Brockville, because I'm down South Mountain. So really, it was just a very colorful sky. I ran and got the camera, shot inside. It was still a, be a beautiful minus 10 outside. The snow was about that high yet. And um, that's it. Just got and a bit, of a, a bit of a moon pillar up here, too. So uh, yeah, just right place, right time. Just uh, grabbed the camera and took a 20-second uh, a exposure on ISO 1600 at uh, f7.1. Just one lucky shot. I took a few. That's just uh, the best one of all. That's it. Thanks. Okay, wonderful observations this month. 
Okay, next up is uh, Tim Cole, our Ottawa Centre member, and he's going to talk about the astrolabe and, uh, and principles of the astrolabe and uh, the evolution of it over time. Tim. Hello. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> that is unmistakably Tim. Yeah, it's me. I don't even have a mirror I can check out. Okay. Um, most people, when they're thinking of an astrolabe, are actually uh, thinking of the old style uh, Mariner's astrolabe, the one that you see uh, Champlain holding upside down at Nepean Point. Uh, he's not holding an astrolabe, he's actually holding a pizza cutter. Um, but uh, what I'm going to focus more on is the um, planispheric astrolabe, which has absolutely nothing to do with the observer's planisphere. Um, well, actually it does have a bit to do, but not all that much. Uh, what we've got on the screen right here is a really gorgeous astrolabe from um, probably the peak of the period of production of European astrolabes. This was done by a master maker by the name of uh, Jean Fusaurus. Um, and what we can see here, if you look carefully, you've got uh, a, a rule and the, uh, the limb, which looks quite familiar for anybody who's used a planisphere. But if you look in here, there's a very delicate network of lines and circles. And above this, a rather confusing looking uh, piece of, of artwork that, oddly enough, actually portrays the heavens. Um, just a very, very quick peek of the astrolabe. Here's, a, here's one, a, a European model, disassembled, so you can see the different chunks and bits of it. Uh, there would actually have been a bunch of different plates, which we'll get into in a moment, uh, for different latitudes. We can trace it back to about 150, uh, well, CE, common era, AD if you prefer, doesn't really matter, um, where Ptolemy, the same guy who came up with the Ptolemaic system, uh, describes the method of stereographic projection. And this was a method of taking the celestial sphere and smashing it down onto a plane. The cool part is you can do it all with plane geometry. You don't need anything that Euclid and company wouldn't have worked out themselves. I couldn't find much reference for anything over the next few hundred years, but there obviously had to be some interest because by the middle of the ninth century, two uh, particularly well-written um, Arabic mathematicians by the name of Al-Fargani and Al-Khwarizmi, and if any of you recognize the name there, uh, the basis of the word algorithm out of Al-Khwarizmi, uh, came up with a set of tables to make it easier to do them. So there was obviously a fair bit of interest. Slowly over that period, the astrolabe reached Europe, as near as I can tell, largely through returns from the Crusades and such like. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of, of work in Europe on methods of computation, which pretty much drove the astrolabe out of wide-scale use in Europe, but it still persisted heavily in the, uh, in the Arabic world. Uh, much of the major use in the Arabic world was for calculating prayer times and uh, for uh, finding the uh, direction of Mecca. And an awful lot of the use for the astrolabe in Europe was for finding the times for prayers at monasteries. So an awful lot of this was inspired by religious ritual. Now, I'm going to take a look at the uh, elements of the astrolabe. And this is a, uh, a modern reproduction of a typical European astrolabe from about the, uh, oh, let's say about 1300 or so. And I'll just take a look quickly at the, at the bits of it. it. It really looks complicated, but it's not as bad as it seems. It is a busy, busy area. The throne here um, is simply what you suspend the uh, astrolabe from, and they ranged anywhere from being just a, a hole in the edge to this incredibly uh, ornate piece of artwork. Moving from there, you've got the limb, where you see the scales for um, time and for altitude. And the plate, which is the part we're going to look into in considerable detail, and this is where uh, really the computation bit of the astrolabe happens. And then finally you've got a rule, I put a little blue halo on it so you can see it more clearly. And all that is is just a ruler with sometimes a different scale on it. In this particular case is a scale on it for the declination of the sun. If you look at the back of it, the front part is fairly standard, given your particular latitude. The back, they had a little more uh, latitude, no pun intended. Um, yeah, I usually have worse puns than that. I'll have to work on a few. Um, we had an altitude scale on the side for measurement, just simply measuring altitudes. And around this, we have a calendar, zodiac representation, and then for this particular model, a, um, a solar latitude number. 
Uh, the calendars would have been a mess at that point in the Middle Ages because uh, there was a piecemeal changeover from the old Julian calendar to the, to the Gregorian that wasn't really finished until 1917. So every country of origin would have had their own separate calendars. But what you saw around it is the, um, the constellations of the zodiac subdivided into 30 degrees within it. And this would have been a method that almost any educated person in the Middle Ages would have been able to handle for finding a, a reliable position for the sun. The other two things, now the, the bits inside the middle, these varied all over the place. And pretty common though for the European astrolabe were the shadow square down here, which was basically a simple little trigonometric converter. Uh, this would let you do things like calculate distances to a wall or calculate the height of a tree or some such thing. Um, what we'd call it now is basically a tangent or a cotangent lookup table. And on top, unequal hours, which I'm not going to get into too deeply, but it's kind of an interesting sideline here. Um, what most pre-industrial societies had done is they divided the day into daytime and nighttime, and then each, each part of that was divided into 12 hours. So no matter how long the daylit portion was, or no matter how long the night portion was, it was still divided into 12. So as the year changed, the length of the hour changed. And you can see this if you take a look at some of the older references. They'll talk about the third hour of the morning or the second hour of the evening or something like that. Now, that really works reasonably well for civil life, but it's, it's not usable for any kind of a systematic timekeeping system or for astronomy. So what would be included here would be a, a conversion chart to go from unequal hours, which would change length by the season, and um, the equal hour that you needed to do any kind of calculation. And then finally, you have a, an alidade for measuring altitude, and there'd be a couple of other scales tacked on for different, different things and different uses. So let's take a look at how the front is put together, because this is where most of it goes. So we have the throne, where we suspend it. We have the limb here, which I've used the simplified version of these two astrolabe models I've got, because it's a little easier to see what's going on. And then inside, we have the uh, mater or mater, depending on which dictionary you look at, which basically would be the holding point for the plate. And if you had one of the nice metal ones, it would have been recessed. So there, on top of that, we've got the plate. I've dimmed out the limbs. You can see the plate a little more clearly. And I'm going to go into what's in that plate in a little more detail as we move on. Sitting on top of the plate, you'll notice I've dimmed the plate back. We have the element known, if you're going to look at the Latin, that's supposed to be reti. Most people seem to pronounce it reet. Uh, so I'll stick to reet, because reti just sounds incredibly, oh, I don't know. Um, Yes, I'm going to take a look at the reti, yes. Uh, very, very pompous, um, so I'll stick to reet, thank you. Um, the reet is the representation of the sky, and this is the modernized version of the reet, and what we see here are calendar dates, though in the old-fashioned ones we would have had references to the constellations of the zodiac. And then on top of that we've got the rule. So you've got two moving elements, the reet and the rule. The plate would have been very securely uh, mounted into the matter to keep, it, to keep it in place. So now I'm going to take a look at the plate. What the, what the astrolabe is, is incredibly, it's a very, very sophisticated analog computer for doing coordinate conversions as much as anything else. And again, the incredible part is it's all done with plane geometry. You could, in principle, uh, do the entire drawing here with a uh, compass and a straight edge. And in fact, that's the basics of the design. Um, it's incredibly tedious, so there were tables and, and little measuring devices made early on to help do it, but you can, in principle, do it with compass and straight edge. So what we have here, centered, for the, uh, for the equatorial parts, because this is the part that ties to the sky, we have the uh, North Celestial Pole, not that they ever quite referred to it as that. Um, the line here, um, direct line from west to east, is known as the right horizon. And what this was actually, this, this is a great circle looked at edge on. So this is the projection of a circle looked, at, looked upon edge on. At the outside limb, we have the Tropic of Capricorn, which would be the furthest extent that we could reasonably do the projections, and we'll see it as another uh, very, very useful application for having that. Inside the equator, and then inside that, the Tropic of Cancer. So these give us a representation of the moving sky. What we now have superimposed on this are the horizontal bits. 
And for this, we have a whole network of azimuth arcs, which um, they're, they're pretty intricate little things to do. And these will give you your direction in, in, in horizon coordinates, um, with a bit of question as to whether they're measured from the north or the south. Historically, they did, uh, they did both, which uh, adds to con some, some considerable confusion when you're looking up the data on it. The other little one that's odd for most eyes is this little curve here called the prime vertical. And what this is, is it's the line that passes through the zenith and touches the uh, right horizon right where it hits the uh, east-west, uh, sorry, where it's, excuse me, let me back up, where we're, uh, where we're touching the east-west right horizon and where we're touching at the same time the oblique horizon. And that's the horizon that you see. It's a little odd, the usage is that that's the horizon you see. That's, that's the horizon that you have apparent from your position. We have these little crepuscular arcs, which are lines of altitude for twilight. And in this case, they've calculated it for uh, the times for civil and uh, nautical and astronomical twilight. Um, Middle Ages, there were a number of things that required, required twilight, but the, the, the standards for what, con what constituted twilight were all over the place. So it seemed like each instrument maker would have had his own standards on, on what he wanted to use. And then finally, oh, back up, you, you silly thing. Um, the other thing what we've got are these little circles centered. They look like they're centered around the zenith, but they actually aren't. Um, the centers actually line up along the meridian, uh, called alma canters, uh, which are basically lines of, of constant altitude in the sky. So what we've done here is we've got alt as system and equatorial system all smushed onto one plate. So what I'm going to take a look at now is how to construct the plate. And I'm hoping by that we can break it down and get rid of some of that incredible mess that makes it so tricky to pick out exactly what's in there. So I'm going to start here just by looking at the really basic stuff, North Celestial Pole, Meridian, Right Horizon, and at the very outside of the plate we've got the Tropic of Capricorn. Inside that, then we have the concentric circles for the equator and the Tropic of Cancer. So this takes care of our equatorial system. Now let's start drawing on the uh, horizontal system. And we have a couple of construction circles here that we're using to form the uh, prime uh, vertical and the oblique horizon. Something you'll discover when you look into how these things had to be made is construction lines had to be drawn all over these things. And it, it must have been a horrendous task to draw those things on and then get rid of them in your final product. I mean, this, this, these were incredibly intricate and difficult to make things. So for constructing the prime vertical, um, what we have is a circle that passes through the zenith and the uh, points where the horizons meet. And there's a standard construction. Uh, once upon a time, I used to know that from geometry, but use a standard construction for fitting a circle through three points. And the oblique horizon then becomes uh, an altitude line with zero degrees. And you'll find that there's some standard constructions and formulas for, for uh, altitudes. So now we can just get rid of our construction circles and move on. Now the next bit are the, are the almacanters. And they do look at first glance to be concentric, but they're not. Uh, the centers actually move slowly up the, uh, the meridian based on your latitude. And this would have been one of the first things that was tabulated. So instead of having to do your construction for every single circle of constant altitude, you'd have a table for your latitude, which would show you you're going to put it so far from the zenith point. And that, that, made, uh, that made life a heck of a lot easier for, um, for astrolabe makers. The uh, azimuth arcs, these suckers are tricky. Um, they are all perfect circles, even though it doesn't really look like that, but the circles compared to the plate are enormous. So drawing these things would have been incredibly difficult because you'd have huge circles. You'd have had to use trammel extensions for your compasses. And it turns out even for plotting these things by computer nowadays, uh, you've got to use some high precision drawing algorithms for the circles simply because you'll start having uh, rounding errors, get it all messed up. You do have a bit of an advantage because of all the symmetry. You only have to do a quarter of the calculations, but it's still a tremendously tedious job to get this stuff done. And then finally, we're going to put the whole assembled thing together. I've left the color coding on. So it's, it's, it's tight, it's complex, but it's not as hideously difficult as it, as it seems when you first look at it. And when I first opened the bag and got these models and said, oh my flaming oath, what do I do with this? 
Um, now, the plates change for latitude. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show this how the plates change moving from the equator up to the North Pole. And here what we see is the right horizon and the oblique horizon are coincident, which is kind of what you'd expect for the equator. And as we move further north, here 25 degrees latitude, roughly the tropics, here's, we, here's our location more or less. And uh, there we have Paul's, well, okay, he didn't go that far north, but close enough. Um, and then finally we get up to the North Pole where our zenith and the North Celestial Pole are coincident. So uh, the latitudes have to be done separately. And this turned out to be a real problem for the, uh, for the planospheric astrolabe. What was typically done is um, these would have sets of plates that would be done for the classical climata. Uh, the origin of our word climate, which would have been the, the, the zones of uh, classical Greek history where it was considered suitable for people to live. And they, the, the numbers varied anywhere from nine climata to something like 22. Now I'm going to take a look at the reed here. Okay, reed. I'm not going to get all snooty on us. I'm going to take a look at the reed here. What you'd love to have is a transparent reed that would represent the star field and the ecliptic. Problem is, in the Middle Ages, not a practical thing. You just couldn't get glass that thin, uh, that flat, or that uh, that sturdy. So it really was an impossibility. So what they had to come up with, and this is in fact where the name comes from, the term reedy, a network or a network or spider, uh, and nowadays we have reed as a network. Um, what you'd have is a metal mask that would have had cutouts, or little pointers here for a number of stars. I left the star chart behind it so you can see where the various pointers would indicate. Now, this particular uh, computed model I'm using doesn't label any of those points, so you just have to know what the stars are. Uh, it appears that most of the astrolabes made at the time would have had a, a label marked on the point to indicate what star they were referring to. So you, you didn't have a lot of stars here, and as we'll see, that's not a big problem for what the thing's intended for. If we take a look at the traditional markings versus modernized markings, you can really see here how we're emphasizing the uh, constellations of the zodiac and their subdivisions and the, uh, the, the time of the calendar. This basically just cuts out a step in doing your computations, but it wasn't practical for them uh, because your calendar became a, a humongous mess because of all the calendar dates. And this would have been a very natural way to work and a natural way for people to think of it. They were much more concerned about the, the, you know, the astrological implications and such like. One m cute little sideline is uh, there, there's an interesting cons construction, geometrical construction, for getting these lines on the, uh, the, ecliptic, the ecliptic circle to point to the center. Uh, it's, it's an intriguing little piece of plane geometry, which I can only grit my teeth and think some poor beggar had to do that for 360 of them. Um, we'll take a look at the northern hemisphere. You can actually get them done for the southern hemisphere as well. You just have a different star field. The plates are identical for northern and southern. You just invert the latitudes. Uh, but you'd have a different set of star fields. And this would be what your reet would have looked like for the Middle Ages. It would have just been this with perhaps some markings on it, and it would represent this. So what was, what was the point of all this? The whole point was to do computations that nobody knew how to solve. And one of the big classic problems of ancient uh, astronomy was known as the rising problem. It was actually the rising and setting problem, but you know the rising problem is how it shows up in the literature. And this is basically, when will the sun rise or set, and where will it rise or set? And I've just kind of whimsically shown that with the starry night background for, uh, for Stonehenge. Now, you can work this out with um, analytical spherical geometry, and there's the standard uh, equation that I've lifted from Mayus's astronomical algorithms relating the uh, local hour angle to a nominal um, altitude for the different bodies. This allows for the size of, of the body and your latitude and your, um, your declination. And here we've got a uh, simulated astrolabe with a cool little program that I'll give you the references for later on. And what we've done here is set this thing up to do the calculation for the time of sunrise for today. You had to remember this particular uh, astrolabe is printed for 2014, so it, it, this is a contemporary one. 
in that sense. So let's take a look and see what we've got here. If we take a look at the setup, and I'll show you in just a sec how we get the setup, we see that our sunrise this morning would have been a few minutes before 420. And then we adjust for DST. And we'll take a look and see what Starry Night comes up with. And we see 515. And we look up from the alt from the azimuth lines here, we get about 55 degrees. And this is saying just short of 56 degrees. And this took me uh, a couple of seconds to drag a mouse on the, uh, on the computer. And it took me about 15 to 20 seconds to do it with this. And I have no doubt that if you practiced, you'd probably get it done a lot faster. So how do you do it to go through the steps? So your first step is going to be to find the sun's longitude. So we look up our calendar scale, and this would have been on most of the astrolabes of the period. And from that, we get the longitude, which uh, 76 degrees, or to hold into the way they used to do it, 16.5 degrees into Gemini. We bring that over to the front. We rotate the, uh, come on, behave. We rotate the reedy and the, the, uh, the rule so that the point on the ecliptic lines up with the eastern horizon line. And uh, normally you'd move the rule at the same time, but I've moved it aside here so you can see more clearly what we're doing with the reedy. With the reed. I, I keep getting all snooty on myself. Um, look, so we can see more clearly what's happening with the reed. And from that, then we simply can line up the rule and read the time off directly. So this gives us mean solar time, which of course is what they'd have been working with back then. So now, let's see if we can actually improve this a bit by looking at modern corrections. So we start with 4.20 a.m. mean solar time, so we're going to tack on the hour to go for nighttime wasting time. And um, now we're going to tack on the corrections that we have to apply. So first correction, equation of time. Uh, we're not used to seeing it quite plotted like this, but this is the equation of time done in polar, in polar coordinates, if you like. And not surprisingly, since we're fairly near the solstice, our equation of time correction is minus one minute. If you recall, that's the, uh, the relationship between mean solar time and actual, and actual solar time, because the sun's always getting ahead and behind. And now we're going to take a look for at the longitude correction, because we're not smack in the middle of our time zone. So we have to make a minor adjustment for where we are within the time zone. For Ottawa, it comes to minus three minutes and four seconds. And I'm far too lazy to include the compensation for four seconds. So add it all up, and we end up to 4.16 AM, which comes awfully close to what Starry Night computed for the aid of a few seconds of mechanical manipulation on one of these little things. And. Um, I keep pointing it out, this is all plain geometry. No uh, spherical trig is required. So this becomes a pretty powerful little tool for solving this fundamental question of, uh, of astronomy for many, many centuries. So let's take a look and see what we're actually doing with this. So we're going to start with our happy little Earth and our position on it. And our natural, obvious way to do it is we look at, health, at, at our horizontal system. We look at alt as. So we stand up and we, uh, we basically see our position in the sky. We have a plane that's tangent to where we are on the Earth. Now, if we're looking at how to tie that to the stars, to the celestial sphere around us, we've got to consider the equatorial. And now we're looking at another plane cutting through the equator of the Earth. And if we take a look at the, uh, oh, behave, stop that. Thank you. If we take a look then at the, at the second grid, it looks kind of similar, but the lines are now bent, and it becomes a horrendous, you know, it becomes a lot, little more of a horrendous mess. And then finally, if you want to take in solar time, uh, then we've got to start considering ecl the ecliptic, which now we know is the plane of the solar system. But of course, back then, we'd have simply looked at it as the path of the sun and the sky. And when you tack on that grid, well, it, it's it's a pretty mind-numbing mess, and the. Uh, the, the spherical trig computations can get really quite messy and involved, and you've really got to do some careful programming to keep from making all kinds of stupid round-off errors. So it's still non-trivial to do it. And it's not super hard or anything like that. It's all standardized, but you've got to be careful with your coding. Now, the astrolabe, in fact, did not look into the full ecliptic coordinate system. We just looked at a chunk of the ecliptic. But the point is, is we are taking these three completely disparate systems and pulling them onto one very cool little mechanical computer. So we'll take a look at this here. We're going to take a look and see here how we've linked 
the equatorial to the horizontal, and we already saw that earlier, and this is why I've dimmed the limb out. And now we're going to apply our starry background to it. Now that, that background would move, because that's, that's the reek which can rotate. And now, if we're going to apply the time, now we've got to apply the, uh, the ecliptic. And now you'll notice I've added the circles for, all I could get was when I plotted this out, you can get all of them or none of them. So I've got uh, the Tropic of Cancer, the equator, we don't really care about at the moment, and the Tropic of Capricorn. And if you look carefully, you'll notice the ecliptic rides right between those, which is exactly what you'd expect when you take a moment and think of what the tropics are, the points where the sun is exactly overhead. Uh, at one day of the year. So this is showing how the sun's moving compared to our horizontal and equatorial systems. And this is how we're able to link the times to the stars. And th that's a pretty clever thing to do. The key to all of this is the old, I call it classical in scare, in scare quotes, uh, stereographic projection. And all that is, is it's a method of plotting a sphere onto a plane. And this was known as far back as at least 150 in the Common Era, and probably earlier because that's the first known record of it. And again, it's all done with plane geometry. The odd thing with this is that they're projecting onto the equatorial plane. And I'll show you in a sec that that's a little bit unusual for projections. The other oddity with this one is when you plot it out, you end up with looking down onto the sphere so that everything looks backwards to our eyes. We're standing outside of the celestial sphere and looking in on it. And uh, it took a few moments before I could realize why they did it that way, and it really shows how the philosophy works out. So I'm going to take a look at other similar projections, what I call here the classical stereographic, where we have a projection point. All our rays emanate from the South Pole. And the modern day stereographic, where you're projection plane, the aspect as it's called, is tangent to the North Pole. And this is the classic stereographic projection. You'll see this in a lot of uh, astronomical programs. And down here you'll see the azimuthal polar aspect projection and you'll find most modern planispheres, observers planispheres are plotted like that. And the trick there is you move your projection ray source down so that you've got the maximum possible coverage. Uh, your, your furthest ray is exactly tangent to the sphere, so it gives you the least possible distortion. So the observer's planisphere, and by sheer fluke, uh, this would be the one that uh, you saw earlier today, it has some superficial resemblance to it, and it has that planisphere name in it. But the only real comparison there is that you're taking a plane to represent the sphere. In this case, this is to help an observer find out what's going to be visible. So you're doing an analog computation to figure out what stars you're going to see. And you'll notice that, oh, stop that. You'll notice the stars are what you would see from the ground. The consequence for that is east and west are inverted, which drives a lot of people nuts when you start showing them how to use planispheres because it, it, sometimes it's kind of interesting showing people. They don't quite catch that they're inverted. They just know there's something wonky, and that's... Again, this is all because we're trying to figure out what the stars are. Whereas the astrolabe goes the other way around. The astrolabe, the assumption is whoever is using it knows where all the stars are. You're not using this to find stars. You're using this so that the stars are going to help you make a calculation that you might or, for, you know, for whatever reason, you find useful. So the stars are your tools rather than what you actually care about. And you could start seeing it if we compare a planispheric disk. So here's the planisphere that we've used in the uh, museum's um, planisphere disk, the star wheel. And here we have the, uh, the REIT generated from the uh, little simulated astrolabes I showed you earlier. And here you have the ecliptic projected. But take a look. Here's your first clue about how this works differently. You'll notice that the calendar goes backwards compared to the observer's astrolabe. And if you take a close look at Orion, it's much easier to see that this one is showing the star, the sky inverted, and this one is showing it as the observer sees it. Uh, my first thought was this must be horribly confusing, and it turns out when you look at it the way the astrolabe is intended, which is a calculation device where you know where the stars are, it's not as confusing as you'd think. Uh, whereas I think it would be terribly confusing if you're trying to use that to look and say, oh my, what's up, what's visible? That would drive you nuts. 
But on the other hand, this has the compass directions right. So this becomes a really useful device for trying to figure out surveying problems. Where are you on the ground? Where will the sun rise? Where is east? Where is west? How do I figure it out from star positions? How do I do this when I don't have anything really but a knowledge of the sky? So it's a different intent in what these things are for. This is a computer for finding useful stuff. This is a computer for what's up to see. Now, what happened in Europe, less so in the Arabic world, but in Europe, um, the move went on to more advanced methods of calculating. Um, the biggest difference is being able to come back with really top quality um, trigonometric tables. Uh, it turns out that making these tables had a really massive problem. You could work out all the tables dating back to Ptolemy, uh, but only for uh, signs. Well, they actually had a function called the chord, which was similar to the sign, but you could only do it in increments of three degrees. You couldn't get it any finer than that. And uh, you might recall from high school, the, there was the old thing that you know, is it impossible? Can you trisect a, a, an angle with a, a, a compass and straight edge? And, you know, it was proven some time ago that it was impossible. So why did anyone care? I mean, was this just, wow, I got to try this? And the whole point was so you could get finer chord tables, or as we call them now, sign tables. But once the, um, the algebraic methods came out, that problem went away. And then once you had the printing press, well, then this becomes a much easier solution. Astrolabes, as we saw earlier, would have been hideously difficult and expensive to produce, even though a great many of them used to be done on paper, uh, and that's why we don't see them, is they simply haven't survived. It's still a staggering amount of work. So by the time we get decent measuring devices, like the sextant, and a good clock, the astrolabe becomes a kind of tedious thing to use. So. The, the famous astrolabe is really, I consider it a degenerate case. They've basically taken away all the really difficult to plot stuff, all the, com all the computationally difficult stuff, and thrown it away in favor of simply the Allidade for measuring elevations. And it didn't take too long before somebody realized, I've got a lot of redundancy here. This is a lot of extra computation. I don't need a full circle. So this, you know, you could see a period of fiddling around. They tried octants and quadrants and sextants, and the sextant seems to have come out as kind of the sweet spot where you've got enough of the circle to do the job and, and make a nice, easy to handle package. So we can take a look at the evolution of that to the marine sextant, which nowadays you can get at ridiculously cheap prices. Uh, here's the classic sextant. It's one-sixth of the circle. Um, we have in the really good sextants, and actually in, in any kind of a decent sextant, you'd have a telescope, but these cheap uh, plastic versions that they mostly use for training, uh, you've just got a peephole and some, uh, uh, some filters to keep from burning your eyes out for doing sun sunspotting. Uh, I'll show you how, the, how the, uh, the mirrors work in just a sec. And an index arm with a Vernier scale, so you, you can get a pretty good uh, altitude measurement uh, with, you know, with, with a, fairly easy, a fairly easy task to do. It seems complicated at first, but uh, I found I could do it reasonably accurately, and uh, um, Brian McCullough was helping me out with that one, being an old navigator. I think he found it hilarious to watching me play with this thing. Uh, Yes, an old salt would probably find my attempts to use a sextant rather amusing, but oh well. So let's take a peek and see how this goes. Um, I made up this model, and this is exactly how they did it back then. You would have holes pierced through it. And how you'd be expected to use this thing, and you can sort of see what I've done here in the picture, is you'd be expected to hold this thing up and dangle it like that, so it's floating, so it's hanging freely, and then line up your alidade with whatever it is you want to look at, either the hill on, on the other side, or a star, or the sun. The sun turned out to be not too bad, because you could get the sun projecting a little dot on your hand. But uh, of course, the circles are finite size, so you've got a bit of error there. And something I discovered is when you're trying to get the thing to point where you want it, it's really easy to mess up its free hanging nature, and that throws a big error into it. So th this is actually surprisingly tricky to use. It looks very simple, but it's really hard to get a good repeatable measurement with it. Whereas the sextant, which seems much more complicated, um, to use that one, you're going to take and line up what you're looking at, and then move your arm back and forth. And this mirror here has the effect of moving your target 
moving an image of your target, in this case the, um, the eaves troughing of my neighbor's house. I'm sure she must have been wondering why I was looking at her window. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it didn't occur to me when I took the image. She also has very large guys that uh, rent rooms from her, so this was a very dangerous exercise. Um, so what we've done here is we've moved that mirror until the image comes down to be coincident with the horizon. And again, this looks very complicated, but it's actually pretty easy to do. Um, it's a very quick motion to get it lined up properly, uh, and it's repeatable, whereas with this puppy, Okay, this hasn't been made with any great degree of, of artisanship, but it's, it was hard to get a repeatable figure. This was repeatable. I can get these repeated to within a fraction of a degree, and I, I'm not that good at using this. I'm, you know, I don't do navigation. I finally wanted to see where we could go with the concept of the astrolabe, which is using a mechanical computer to handle a coordinate conversions or to handle the problems that required ugly, messy computation. Uh, I found a few examples, but this one happens to be a little close to my heart and my interests. This is a gadget that was used to calculate torpedo solutions for submarines. Uh, this is the tool that was known unaffectionately as the ISWAS. And what this did was it tried to relate the coordinate system for your ship, the coordinate system for your target, and then try to come up with a torpedo bearing between the two of them, assume, and full knowing that everything moves. So. This part over here has kind of an astrolabe look to it, if you look at the, the grids. But what we have here is a system where we've taken a very straightforward plotting mechanism, and the process of plotting has done our calculation for us to solve the problem. And in fact, these things were used. This particular one is from the uh, US Navy Historical Ships Association. These things were used as backups to the torpedo computers until almost into the 1960s. Uh, so, I mean, it's still a practical thing. We find the follow-ons to the astrolabe in things like polarisis for ships, in uh, chart tables, modern-day transits, or the flight computers that some of you may have picked up at ground school. Maybe they don't do that anymore, but I remember getting a little flight computer when I was taking ground school classes to help you figure out how you were going to navigate and how you were going to uh, you know, handle your, your rum line bearings and that sort of stuff. And it was basically a little, I realized later, basically a little planisphere. So this stuff shows up in numerous, numerous places. For anybody who's interested in going a little deeper with this stuff, because this stuff really is, is, is fascinating as all get out, uh, the absolute gem for this is James Morrison's The Astrolabe. You can get it through Amazon or get it through Morrison. Um, he'll also sell you um, copy, a pair of, uh, of astrolabes done up like this. One is a copy of the medieval type and one that he's taken for modern. And a little booklet, a 40-page booklet with considerable background on it on how to use this thing to solve problems. And it's, it's really invaluable for figuring out how to make these things work. If you're interested in doing a few other things, and I remember somebody asked me once before about some good references for sundials, then Shadows is a really cool program. Uh, the bottom level of it is free, and that just does a few uh, sundials. You've actually got to buy the uh, second level up if you want to calculate. Oh, stop that, behave. If you want to calculate, come on, behave. Come on, there we go. If you want to calculate astrolabes, you've actually got to go for the most expensive one they've got. But it's a fantastically cool little program, and it really isn't that expensive, even for the most, uh, the most expensive version. So these things are great resources if you're interested in trying to figure out how they did the computations. Or, in this case, if you're looking at making your own sundial, um, which, you know, maybe I'll look into that at some point. Uh, it's, yeah, it's not as if I don't have enough hobbies, right? So. I, I found this a really fascinating piece of history. I just wanted to try and start looking into how one handled plotting these things before you had computers. And uh, it became quite an interesting little, um, little exercise uh, and a really interesting journey to finding out some really, really incredibly cool history. And I know my geekhood is showing up here, but uh, um, I, I suspect most of us here have their inner geeks too. So. Uh, uh, you may find this interesting as I do. So um, I noticed everybody has been super polite and has not yawned, um, screamed in agony, or thrown anything in my general direction. So uh, for the three people who remain awake, um, I will attempt to answer questions, but bear in mind that I'm a novice in this too. So yeah. Wow. Comment 
on the various projections. I can't remember what the first, oh, yes. I actually have a comment on the various projections. I can't remember what the uh, first two were called. You have the classical and the stereo, yes. Yeah, give me a sec here, yeah. This is the this is the, the, the modern map maker stereographic projection. But they seem to be similar. They are incredibly similar. The only difference is the uh, position of the projection plane. Yes, yeah, so th but they would look the same, yes? Uh, they do produce the same. The classical stereographic is always done uh, as if you're looking down on it, and the map maker stereographic is almost always done as if you're looking up at it. Uh, this does give you, I worked out the different uh, proportions, this gives you considerably less distortion. Okay, fine. Gives you an awful lot less distortion at the edges. Make it an easy one, please. Yes, the one, the uh, astrolabe over in the Museum of Civilization, yeah. which is Champlain's actual astrolabe, how does it compare with what you're saying? The, the Champlain astrolabe is the Mariner's astrolabe. It's a device, its sole function in life is measuring elevations, measuring altitudes. So this would be part of taking a sun sight. And the problem with this is the sextant will beat its pants off every time. You'll get a more accurate, easier to handle measurement. But that's, that's all. all this thing is. It's an angle measuring thing. This is what I call the degenerate case of the planisphere. At that point, you had all the tables to do it for you. OK, last question. OK, we actually are over. So um, thank you very much, Tim. Bye, guys. You know, about uh, three months ago, I was talking to Tim about this presentation here, and he, he said to me, he said, uh, it's going to take me a while to put this together. I, I can't imagine the amount of work that was put into in preparing this presentation with all the, with all the material. Labor of love, my friend. Labor of love. Well, it was a, tr a tremendous piece of work. Thank you very much, Tim. Okay, let's wrap up real quick. Um, uh, International Astronomy Day, the museum always invites us to their uh, event that they host uh, here uh, at, at the museum. Very, uh, uh, it's an important event for us to attend because we can, they let us use this, this room uh, at, a, at a, a really attractive rate. We're very, very fortunate to have that. We need to return the kindness. We had a number of volunteers that participated and uh, Chris here he was the organizer of the event. Very well done, Chris, thanks. And thank you to everyone that volunteered. If you want to watch this meeting again, uh, it's, it is broadcast live and also recorded. Um, so just what I tell people is, and is uh, just Google RASC, um, Ustream, R RASC Ottawa, Ustream, and you'll find this link. And uh, you'll need a flash player to play it. And uh, you'll, you'll see that the, the, it is broken into two segments, before the break and after the break. Next. Um, our telescope, um, or pardon me, our uh, astronomy library just right around the corner here. Estelle is the librarian. Uh, she has a pick of the month, the night sky, observer sky. Next. Um, right after the meeting, we meet at, uh, uh, you're invited to um, sort of a social gathering at, uh, at Kelsey's just right up the road at uh, Saint Laurent Lanc at Lancaster. Uh, tonight we had a pretty good attendance, 123. We don't have a number for uh, online, but uh, I, think we, I think we did really well. And thank you very much to the, uh, to the speakers. Next meeting is, uh, is um, Friday, July 4th, at the same place. Um, we're going to close the meeting now. I'm going to call the, um, the door prizes here. So uh, the folks on the internet, thank you for attending and, and, and watching. And uh, we'll close the meeting and we'll, um, as I said, uh, I'll call out the door prize number. So.